you have your Bibles with you, please open, as you can see, to the book of 2 Corinthians and go to chapter 3, and we will be reading the last two verses of chapter 3 in 2 Corinthians. You're there now. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Thank you this morning for the assembled worshipers, the bride of Christ here to hear your word and God let me preach it and speak it properly, Lord, according to what your meaning is and Lord let us all remember that we must first be unveiled before we can be the glory of the Lord before we can be transformed. So whether one is now unveiled or not, Lord, we pray that your word this morning would do its mighty work in the hands of your assembled people. Amen. So before we focus on these two verses this morning, let's briefly recap Paul's writing up to this point. In 2 Corinthians, Paul begins by describing his troubles and sufferings he endures as an apostle to make God known. Then he focuses on God's salvation through Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit. He speaks about the old covenant, the law carved in stone, the ministry of death, the ministry of condemnation, he calls it, saying it was actually indeed glorious. Paul recalls how Moses would put a veil over his brightly shining face after he spoke with God. Those carved stones with the law, they were gloriously given by God. Problem is, people lack ability to truly obey them, and thus the ministry of condemnation. Then, Paul speaks of the New Covenant, which brings righteousness to sinners like you and me, salvation through faith in Christ, the much greater glory, which is permanent, so the old has no glory by comparison. Paul continues with the veil imagery, unbelievers having a blinding veil over their eyes so they don't love the gospel. Jesus Christ. He prefaces our verses with these words about the great hope for lost, unbelieving sinners. When one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. The veil is removed and blindness is undone. Salvation and faith are real. And the result is our verses for today, 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now in the first verse, 17, we focus on this freedom Paul is speaking about. The Holy Spirit brings salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ to new believers who are unveiled by the mercy and work of God alone, and in that there is freedom, true freedom. And this freedom will lead us nicely into verse 18 regarding the transformation of believers. But first, 
this word freedom. The culture we live in, freedom, being free to be myself, is high and very lifted up. We love that word freedom. For many, it is the foundation of their lives. Discovering one's own inner desires and following them wherever they lead. That is, as long as they don't hurt anyone else. But Peter, he gives us insight about how freedom can work for many in the corruptness of our culture and even in the church. False teachers who love the lusts of false freedom. About them, Peter says, they promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of depravity. They teach others those things because the listeners have itching ears who really desire the same things as those false teachers. Paul makes it clear in Romans 6 when he describes how this freedom is manifest in the lives of people. On the one hand is the freedom unbelievers think they have, but actually it is a state of being slaves of sin. For unbelievers, you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. So the true state of the unbeliever's freedom, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. That's the illusion of freedom for unbelievers. Unbelievers are definitely free. Free with regard to righteousness outside its proper control. The opposite of our verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Paul describes true freedom, that which only believers have having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Then he follows with an initial peek at today's text, our verse 18, about believers' transformation into the image of Christ. Paul finishes, now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life Jesus challenged those who claim to be believers and he challenges every one of us again today about freedom if you abide in my word you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free when they scoffed at him, he continued, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Then he gave the foundation of true freedom, rejecting the world's fake news freedom. Jesus tells the crowd, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Set free by true saving faith in Christ, believing in his offer of forgiveness for your sins, its penalty paid by him upon the cross. A great yearning in the human heart is to be free. Free to do whatever one wants. To be autonomous. To ponder how one will live as centers of their own universe not acknowledging they are a creature created by a sovereign God who rules over all. A free-thinking human chooses whatever they please in their imaginary universe. And since they are at heart totally depraved, their freedom leads them to choose sin. But the end of sin is enslavement and death, slaves of sin. And so the conclusion, human chosen freedom, especially the kind modern Americans in particular might imagine, is a mirage. 
doesn't exist. True freedom for the unredeemed as they imagine, it is not possible in the world God created for his glory. Only improper slavery. God's word tells me how to transfer my enslavement. That may not be a popular way to say things these days. The unredeemed heart, the heart unchanged by God's sovereign mercy, continues as a slave to sin. But by God's mercy, those born again to know and love God, by the work of the Holy Spirit, now become new slaves. Slaves of their Savior, their Creator. There is your true freedom. That's right, transfer your enslavement. Does that make some uncomfortable? Humans who resist acknowledging they are a creature under the sovereignty of another? The God who created them? But trust the word. Our verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom believers have. Knowing the truth and escaping the snare of the devil who had previously captured each of us to do his will. Free from a life of slavery to fear of death. Not free from death, but free from the fear of it, since a believer trusts in his God-given redemption, that by faith he knows his penalty for sin is upon Christ, and hell is no longer his destiny, but the glorious final redemption to be with Christ forever and one is free from thinking just trying to keep the law of God will achieve that redemption believers are free from many things things like when fellowshipping in God's church we are free to look past skin color or ethnicity as we live with and love our fellow believers because Christ frees us from that because we're being renewed in knowledge after the image of our creator, not in sinful human made up knowledge. So we are free like Paul and say like Paul, not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. This must be be us believers, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Yes, we are free from many things. We believers who have been bought with the precious blood of Christ no longer belonging to ourselves, but to him who died for us and was raised again. No longer living for ourselves, but for him living in the freedom of Christ. With Peter always echoing in our ears, live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as servants of God. And in the serving, we are not just free from things we went over, we are free to, free to many new things as believers, free to pursue holiness. And righteousness free to live the way God intended us when he created us under his yoke under his law James describes our lives of proper law-keeping freedom what he calls the perfect law the law of freedom we are called by God to believe to live freely to walk as believers in this promise from James about the law of freedom if we continue in it, not becoming a forgetful hearer. This person will be blessed in what he does, blessed to be free too, free to rejoice in Christ. He saved me, I am in Christ. That joy is your strength for life. It comes from being free to pursue Christ's holiness, to pursue his righteousness, foundationally by knowing 
studying the law of freedom right here. Free to believe and be reminded of and trust in the amazing promises God makes to you as a believer as you walk with him. Some very sobering about disobedience and the consequences of sin. Others, impossible for us to even begin to truly comprehend about the glory of God, which we will know perfectly after this life. All provided for us in the word delivered to us. To be reassured, to be re-strengthened, to be recomforted. Those are all re's as in do it over and over because of our proneness to wonder. Of course, we are free to come to the throne of grace, to pray, to be heard by God who acts according to his perfect will for us believers. And free to hold things loosely, relying on this truth from God our Father. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. The one true God who is able to make all grace abound to you as you do your good work. To be free to look at birds of the air, the grass of the field, who God takes perfect daily care of. Turn from anxiety to worry, seeking first his kingdom as he adds to you what you need. To say, yes, God, thanks for reminding me. We brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. To look at injustice, sin, evil, being performed and celebrated all around you and toward you, free to say, vengeance is the Lord's, he will repay. And all that all works out depends on where we decide to build our lives. Do we call him Lord, hear his words, and then do what he tells us? And in doing that, we dig deep and lay our foundation on the rock of Christ. Surviving the floods of life's difficulties, temptations to sin, or persecution when it comes, not on sand, but on the rock, and stand on the rock in persecution. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, the reward is great in heaven. And so then, a final example of what a believer is free to, loving enemies, or maybe it's free from hating your enemies. Let's say you're free to trust God's promise of the future for all mankind. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin, and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. What then? Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father, in that kingdom, finally free from our sinful nature, we will glory in God and enjoy Him forever. So now, what glorious work is God doing in us as we live in the freedom God has given us? Paul goes on in our text this morning, verse 18. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The Holy Spirit working in you. The veil removed by God's mercy, so he does to and for you what he planned before the foundation of the world, saving you, and then that we should live to be holy and blameless before him transformed from one degree of glory to another. The lifelong process of sanctification as we live freely in Christ. That transformation coming, as verse 18 says, from beholding the glory of the Lord. Paul 
goes on a few verses later to say something similar and clarify. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There it is again, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Like our verse 18, beholding the glory of the Lord after the veil is removed. So the knowledge of the glory of God comes in the face of Christ, the person of Christ. That's how we humans behold the glory of God, so we may be transformed into the same image. The ultimate goal of our lives as Christians, Hebrews commands the same thing as we run our race, looking to Jesus, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. So how are we going to properly behold him? One possible way is to look to God's creation. John did say, all things were made through Jesus, and without Jesus was not anything made that was made. So we see his glory in massive abundance. From the heavens to the tiniest little creature. And in Romans. His invisible attributes. Namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made. But unfortunately, as we marvel at that creation, truth is, it is badly marred by sin to the point it groans now until Jesus redeems it. Someday, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption, but not now. Beholding creation, that is not going to transform us. Only beholding God's Son, Emmanuel, God with us. Our only hope to be rightly transformed the way God desires is to behold the face of Christ. But for many, that physical realm is the only one. For the atheist, the Darwinist, it's all there by chance. No God. So they make their gods totally in their own image, led by their own vain imaginations. For some, like the Jews of the Old Testament, God is the creator, but then they take his creation and fashion it into something they can look at and worship, into idols, like a golden calf, for instance. These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. For the ancient Greeks, many gods controlling everything around them. For them, they even had their unknown god statue as a stand-in when needed. Even Paul and Barnabas might have been gods for the Greeks. The citizens tried to sacrifice to them after they healed the cripple because they thought the gods had finally come down from heaven itself. The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And they were very excited, of course, all their endless searching for understanding about the world and life and death. And now someone from heaven coming to give the answers, explain the mysteries, of course, God did just that and much more in Christ. There's your transformation. God sent his own son, Emmanuel. God himself with us. No more mystery. As Paul says, God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, revealed fully in Christ when we behold the glory of Lord. The riches of the mystery is this, Christ in you, the hope of glory through the gospel. 
Christ, the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world, those of the world who are given salvation by God, received by faith. Many will be confronted with the gospel, but they will not accept or believe it. Some for whom verse 18 does not apply, they have veiled faces. They see no glory of the Lord. They are not transformed. Some beheld Jesus and said, aren't we right in saying you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Others said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. They looked into his face, beheld the glory of the Lord and realized they were sinners. Something like Peter in the boat after the miraculous big catch of fish. Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. So some, by God's mercy, look differently at Jesus, those redeemed by God himself. They knew he is Emmanuel. God himself here is a man, the one with two natures. So for them, for we believers, verse 18, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are then being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. So for us who have had the veil removed to know and believe, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, who died for our sins and was raised again. Shall we live at part of verse 18? being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another? Well, we must behold the glory of the Lord. We must pursue the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We cannot even begin to know all there is about God, but what we most definitely need to know about God, it is in Christ, the Word, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We read our Bible differently, knowing it is the very word of God. We look to the face of Christ, to the person of Christ, as God has shown us right here. The word in his word, so we have clarity and knowledge and understanding, hopefully leading to some wisdom about how to see the world and live in it. To have a worldview which is consistent with the word, because in Hebrews it tells us prophets came first, but then in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. Through his speaking to us in the word, we come to know Jesus' character, his mercy, power, compassion, wisdom, his care for his people, his healings, his miracles, his anger at sin, his saving grace. These and many, many others are our foundation of beholding the glory of the Lord. Living in the world without the saving knowledge of God and his word is similar to being a drunk. You have a ruined perspective. You make wrong decisions. You stumble around. You may think you're doing well, happy and all seems well, but you live in a worldly fog. Life is ultimately unclear and you never truly sober up. But the word, it is sobering to behold the glory of the Lord in the face of Christ. To be reminded your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you from God. That you are not your own, you were bought with a price. The price of Christ's sacrifice upon the cross for your sins. That you must glorify God in your body. That it is only by his mercy you are even beholding his glory the way the true believer does. 
the word makes it very clear. We must no longer live for ourselves, but for him who for our sake died and was raised. The sobering truth of what he told his disciples as he sent them out, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. It is clear. I am in a battle. Is the life Paul describes to Timothy, is that for me? Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. We believers have been enlisted by Christ, so it is very clear I've been enlisted by my commanding officer. It's all very sobering. Makes the life I'm called to in Christ pretty clear. I'm in a battle against my own weaknesses, my sin, and a world of hostility to the things of God, to the glory of God and the faith of Christ. And it's not easy. I need lots of help. But we are called to stand firm. We follow the great high priest. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect was tempted as we are, yet without sin. And we shall wage war, battle against our sin. We who are in Christ, beholding the glory of the Lord. Remember Jesus described in Hebrews, when Jesus was here, he offered up wrenching prayers and cries and tears to the Father. And he was heard because of his reverence. And the result, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And so shall we, as we look into the face of Christ, the person of Christ, we are being transformed Paul tells us how. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. We must see things clearly and soberly through the word of God. Only then can you test and discern things. Like Job, he made clear Paul's point in the first half of Philippians. So that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ to the glory of God. For believers, the things of God become clear through studying and being thoroughly, properly taught the word of God. For those who carefully serve the one who enlisted them, Paul tells us in Ephesians, some are fully equipped to the work of the ministry to build up the church. Why? So we are not tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. And our verse 18 has more about transformation in Christ from one degree of glory to another. This transformation which goes on and on. And for Paul, God is going to be able to use Paul in mighty ways for God's glory as he goes on and on in his transformation. Here in 2 Corinthians, after our verses, Paul writes this about all his afflictions and trials. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Paul was knocked off his horse by Jesus on the road, and God saved him. The veil removed, his transformation commenced, and began to fulfill. Jesus had said about Paul when he saved him, 
I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Paul is writing these things in 2 Corinthians where he many times tells them how his life is going as a follower of Christ. One who has been given freedom in Christ one who has beheld the glory of the Lord is being transformed into his image. And it is from one degree of glory to another. But how difficult is it one degree to another? After praising God in the beginning sentences of this book, he writes about his afflictions, his sharing abundantly in sufferings, his despair of life, utterly burdened, deadly peril, feeling the sentence of death. He goes on many times to speak of his toiling and hardships, crushed, and perplexed, and persecuted, and beaten, and imprisoned, and stoned, and hungry, and thirsty. But of course, he gives glory to God for seeing him through it all as he loves the church and delivers the gospel. All through this book, he speaks of God's work in him, transforming and strengthening him so he can strengthen others. His being transformed from one degree of glory to another gives us lots of hope to trust God will see us through to the end, no matter what. But for Paul, his heart for the lost, his abandonment of all to the service of the gospel, perhaps it was the actions of the church belittling him and polluting the gospel he preached. The actions of the church were most grieving and painful for him, what he calls much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears as he admonishes, guides, and prays for them. And Paul says, yes, he has the treasure of the gospel in a jar of clay, his mere mortal body being used to glorify God by relying upon God's power. And in the midst of it all, he has a theme. He says, we do not lose heart. And then he says it again. We do not lose heart. And then we are always of good courage. He's persevering for the things unseen, eternal things. His building from God, not like he lives in down here, wasting away tenth of a body. Be strong, Paul says in Ephesians. Be strong in the Lord. Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Stand in that struggle against evil with that armor, transformed and persevering in Christ. But take a lesson from the life of King David. Recalling David against the mighty Goliath in 1 Samuel. It gives us a guide in using that whole armor of God to stand firm in Christ. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of armor. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. That untested armor was of no use to David. Even though it had great potential, he was unfamiliar. Paul's recounting of all the armor of God, which our God has given us to transform and make us strong in the Lord, is of limited use if 
when you have not been trained by it, transformed by the renewing of our minds through the word of God, so we know how to fasten the belt of truth and put on the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, praying and living ready to go with the gospel, the gospel which brings freedom to you, believer, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free, having his righteousness by faith rather than by works of the law, ready to go with the gospel to the world. They died in David and his claim that God was supreme in the battle. So for David, he used what years of testing and familiar familiarity had given him in using a sling and a rock to slay that Goliath. And yet to those looking on, that sling and rock seemed fully inadequate. And many may look at this book and dismiss it for many reasons, but surely it must be inadequate to be the only real hope for humanity for constantly guiding us in dealing with the problems I and we and the world faces. The biggest problem being lost persons perishing for eternity. But it is the only real hope because it points us, guides us to the person who is the only real hope, Jesus. As Paul says, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So, believe, believe, be unveiled. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord, unveiled to know and live the truth of creation and sin and death and saving faith and forgiveness and obedience are being transformed into the same image by the refining work of God in our lives and renewed minds from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Those who you have called out of darkness previously thinking they lived in freedom. But only being slaves of depravity and sin and blindness. But God, we thank you that we who are yours who have been unveiled, we have the freedom that is in Christ to pursue you, your joy, your kingdom your law of freedom. And we thank you that you never give up on us. You transform every day. So draw us to your word. Draw us to worship the Son so that we may continue to be transformed from one degree of glory to another as only you can do in the hearts and the minds and the lives of the children that you have purchased by your precious name. 